Kia ora, this is Liz. Welcome to Dames Blaze for this week. If you have not already watched my intro video, can I suggest you go look at that now and also um, maybe start at the beginning of John rather than right here in the middle. Today we're doing John chapter 1 verses 38 to 40. So I'm going to read that for you now. All right, where are we? Um, then Jesus turned... Actually, I'll back up. I'm going to start at verse 35, but we are going to study particularly 38 to 40 today. So from 35 then, again the next day, John stood with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following, said to them, what do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, when translated, teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the 10th hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Okay, it's a fairly short passage. So Jesus, sensing or perhaps seeing shadows, turns to confront John's two disciples who've started following him. And we get the first words that the Gospel of John records Jesus speaking. They are important words, weighty words, and they set the stage for how Jesus will deal with everyone he comes across. Those auspicious first words then are, what do you seek? What or tis in Greek can mean who or which or what, so it just as easily could be who do you seek? Their reply would negate this, of course, but it's still relevant to our discussion to consider it from this perspective. When you started following Jesus, who and what did you seek? We had a frame of reference prior to coming to Christ of what and who we thought he was, but was it the right picture that you had in your mind? Is the person you thought you were following the one that you have ultimately ended up following? Good questions. It echoes another of Jesus' poignant questions. Who do you say that I am? Asked of all the disciples, including these two, after some years of living and working alongside him. He had changed in their eyes, become more evident for who and what he was. Has he changed in yours? When I first became a Christian, I don't remember having a firm view of Jesus. Plenty of confused ideas about God. Not so many about Jesus. I don't know how I managed to not have some kind of image. I did attend Sunday school for some years before we shifted here to Greymouth where I live. But I think the only thing that really stuck was an image of a blonde, blue-eyed dude in a robe with his hands outstretched. <laughs> what was your image? Consider that for a bit over the next few days. What do you seek, he asks them. To seek is to say oh. It means to seek by inquiring, to investigate in order to reach a binding resolution or to get to the bottom of a matter. Modern translations might have what are you looking for, which seems the same, but I think the word seek implies more than just a general search. This is about an investigation, not a mere inquiry, and Jesus' questions are not just a simple throwaway phrase to get the conversation going. He's immediately interested in these men, immediately determined to understand their motivations, and forces them to question their own motives and open up from the minute they meet him. It's a good question to ask ourselves, what do I seek? Why do you follow the Lord? Have you considered that lately? What is your purpose in following him? Is it to provide a space in heaven for yourself or to live a happier life? What do you seek in your relationship with God? It's worth taking a little bit of time to sit down and consider those questions, maybe even write down your responses and come back to them at a later date after you've worked out some steps for achieving whatever that goal might be. John's disciples give what appears to me, at the very least, to be rather a weak response. They reduce him as rabbi, which John pops in to tell you means teacher. You'll find these little interpretations throughout John's gospel. John's gospel audience was not primarily Jewish, so he adds in these little subtitles to help his Greek and Roman readers understand what's going on. The word rabbi was a title that was in common use, one that John the Baptist's disciples used for him, as did any disciple of a rabbi. 
It had been in use for around 60 years by this stage, but it was almost exclusive to the Jewish people, which is why John pops in for a moment, like a caption on the TV, just to let you know what he's talking about. Rabbi, say the disciples, where are you staying? Seems a fairly straightforward question. The Greek words mean what the English words mean, so there's no problem there, but it's an odd question, isn't it? Think about it for a second. If you had just met someone, hadn't heard their name yet, or introduced yourself, is the first thing you would ask, where are you staying? What sort of introductory statement is that? Modern people would back away slowly, thinking they'd stumbled upon a stalker or a serial killer. Why would your first question be, where are you staying? Creepy or what? Maybe, maybe not in a culture where hospitality was actually expected. I still think it's a little bit ballsy. Many speculate that it was a simpler way of saying, we have a lot to ask you, but the street is not an appropriate place for this. Can we know where you're staying so we can come round at some other time and pick your brains? Basically, it was their subtle way of asking for an invite home for a cup of tea and a chat at some other time, which is in fact what they get. But Jesus doesn't put it off for another time. Come and see. His second statement, and it has just as much weight as the first. Come and see. Taste and see that the Lord is good. They might have been hoping for his address so they could come visit at a more convenient time for, for Jesus. The time, the right time, was now. To quote Paul, Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. That is 2 Corinthians 6, 2. God doesn't really procrastinate. <laughs> when the time is right, the time is right, you know. For those disciples of John's, the time was then ripe. It was their time to either follow him or go home. They followed wise men because all the words in the world wouldn't give them as much insight and understanding as going and experiencing for themselves what and who Jesus was. They followed him and remained with him for some time. Now there is some debate about how long he stayed with them. Some say John was going by Roman times, which would make the 10th hour 10 o'clock in the morning. Others say John is going by the Jewish reckoning, which would make it four in the afternoon. If it was 10 in the morning, they had all day with Jesus. If it was four in the afternoon, they potentially only had a couple of hours, as the Jewish day finishes at sunset. As far as I'm concerned, I think John was much more likely to use the Jewish form of reference. He uses Jewish form of words throughout his gospel, so it would seem odd to me that he would use a different mode of time. The crux of the scriptures isn't to give you a police description of any event, with all the times and places spelled out with perfection. The point is to show you how those first few disciples responded to Jesus' invitation. They went with him, and they stayed with him for some time. Whether it was over many hours or only two is actually pretty immaterial. What should strike you though, is that the writer can stipulate exactly what time it was, <laughs> the 10th hour, when these two met Jesus. Does this not indicate that whoever this was, he was there, and it made such an, a massive impact on his life that he still remembers it precisely many years later. I barely remember what I was doing last week, in general terms, let alone with that much precision, but this guy remembers the time seems to me that this one fact alone makes it most likely that the author of the gospel was there and was in fact one of the two who followed Jesus. Verse 40 tells you that one of the men is called Andrew. It doesn't mention the other by name, but the bulk of scholars assume this is John, and this detail is one of their corroborating facts. He knew the hour that he met Jesus. He wrote it in his gospel. The evidence for it being John is beginning to stack up. We can't be sure, of course, so let's concentrate on the one we do know, Andrew, who the gospel clarifies as being Simon Peter's brother. Presumably, the name of Simon Peter was well known, but Andrew was either lesser known or could have been confused with some other Andrews who were around when the gospel was written. What of Andrew then? What do we know of this first disciple? Well, we know he's Simon Peter's brother. We know that he was a fisherman. We know that both him and Peter were in business with James and John, the sons of Zebedee. We know that the name Andrew is of Greek origin and it means manly. We know it is Andrew who brings the boy with the loaves and the fishes to Jesus when the 5,000 need feeding, recorded in John 6, 8. 
a detail which is missing in the other Gospels. And we know that it is Andrew, along with Philip, who introduce a group of Greeks to Jesus in John 12, 22. Also a detail missing in the other Gospels. Are you getting the feeling that John is more intimately connected with Andrew than the other Gospel writers? I do, for sure. Which clarifies for me both the relationship that exists between these two and the authorship of this gospel. In fact, I'm not sure why people argue against this being written by the Apostle John. Seems pretty obvious to me. Mark is the only other gospel that specifically mentions Andrew apart from the group of 12 listings. Andrew is mentioned by Mark as being with the top three, that is John, James and Peter. When they question Jesus in private about the timing of the destruction of the temple, you'll find that in Mark 13, 3 to 4. Andrew was not a prominent disciple. You get that, right? He wasn't one of the top three that got to spend serious quality time with Jesus up the mountain and whatnot. He didn't get a lot of words written about him. He didn't appear to be a personality within the group. But without Andrew, there would be no Peter. And Peter had rather a large part to play. Andrew was a middleman, a go-between, drawing people in to meet with Jesus. He didn't seek the limelight. He didn't do big things. He just wanted to serve God and ordinary people. Traditionally, he's believed to have served as a missionary to the Scythians, a nomadic group originally from Iran who eventually ended up in both Russia and Scotland, which could explain why both nations have Andrew as their patron saint. The Scythians were not a huge or important group in Andrew's day, but he served them anyway. He was a middleman who did the job God wanted him to do without fuss or fanfare. They're often forgotten, the middlemen, aren't they? The ones who stand behind the great ones. But oftentimes, it's the background people who do the most work. We're only just hearing about the women who were part of NASA's team during the late 70s. They did all the calculations to make sure the rocket could actually land. They were background people, and yet without them, Apollo 11 would never have landed on the moon. After their conversations with Jesus, Andrew heads off to find his brother. And from the wording of the scripture, we can surmise that John did the same. Andrew found Peter first and greets him with these amazing words, We have found the Messiah. It's a eureka moment in the history of Israel. All those years of waiting, all that anticipation. Think about that for a minute. Imagine you're an Israelite in ancient times. You're all waiting for the Messiah, for the anointed one of God to arrive. You believe that Advent is going to happen in your lifetime and that the Messiah's arrival will herald the return of the Lord to Israel and free you from tyranny and slavery to Rome. Maybe you don't have to imagine that. Maybe you just have to consider how similar our experience is to Andrew's. Are we not all hanging out for the return of the Messiah? Do we not all expect him to return in our lifetimes? Are we not expecting that return to make everything right? Of course we are. Every generation since the days of Jesus has been confident at some point in their lifetimes that Jesus will be returning. It's why we have so many predictions of when he will return. Why people read into the signs of the times, the signs of revelation. If he doesn't return in our lifetime, I'm confident that generations of humans to come will think exactly the same way. In the meantime, we wait. We wait with expectation and hope, just as the Israelites did. Imagine how excited you would be. How that event would fuel your entire life. No wonder they run off to find their nearest and dearest. We would too, wouldn't we? Or would we? Less than 24 hours into this relationship with Christ, Andrew goes to tell his brother, I've been at this for over 25 years, give or take, and I still haven't talked to my brother about Christ. How are you guys doing? You talk to your nearest and dearest about your faith. Ever had the chance? Ever made the opportunity? I've thought about it, prayed about it, I still haven't got the guts to go do it. I'm not sure I ever will. I find it easier to teach children and youth and you guys than go and speak to my own flesh and blood about this marvellous saviour that I know. Of course, his reception would be extremely negative, which is probably what puts me off. Andrew was a lot surer of his brother's reaction than I am of mine. So instead I wait for a moment, a moment when he's open to hearing what I have to say. 
After all, we are told to be mindful of who we speak to, to not throw our pearls before swine, to know our audience. I'm not excusing myself. Yeah, well, I am actually. But it's with good cause. <laughs> a word in due season can do amazing things, but a word out of season can just make people angry and even less inclined to listen. We have found the Messiah. What an amazing testimony that Andrew had. He had discovered and uncovered the truth of who Jesus was. The others had times where they doubted that Jesus was who he claimed to be. Even John the Baptist wavered in his faith when he was imprisoned in Herod's dungeon. But I can't find any record of Andrew wavering. The conversation he and the other unnamed, probably John, disciple had with Jesus must have been a doozy. When Jesus asked him what he sought, his answer was, where are you staying? But he got so much more from Jesus' answer than he would have expected. Curiosity drove him and John to follow after Jesus, a willingness to follow where John the Baptist had pointed. But it didn't take long for Andrew to be fully convinced of who Jesus was, the Messiah. It's a Hebrew word. The Greek equivalent is Christ. And they both mean the same thing, anointed. The the in front of it separates it from all the other anointed people throughout the history of Israel. Prophets, priests, kings, all got anointed. But this one, this one is the anointed one. God's anointed chosen one. Wow. It's quite a statement. We'll have to wait for next week to discover how Peter responds to it. This week, consider how you respond to it. He's your Messiah, the anointed one. The one God has chosen to be the saviour of the world. If he's not your Messiah, why is he not? What holds you back from this full revelation of Christ's character? It's okay to have questions, but don't let them remain as only questions. Seek wise counsel, build your understanding and your faith. And until next week, God bless. Takite.